Welcome to another Sunday Superversive live stream. I am your host, Benjamin Wheeler, and as always, I'm here with my stalwart but sadly Italian co host, Anthony Marchetta. And we're joined today by uh, Mary, the author of Paper Doll Veronica, Bovidar of the Bears, uh, and so much more. Mary, how are you doing? Welcome to another Sunday. No, somebody. I'm I am your host, Ben. Always up here with my I, oh no! I think that was me. <laughs> Sorry about I'm that. I'm only here for the diversity points, so. Yep. Go ahead. Can't say we have. <laughs> Is it working properly now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm very happy to be here. Glad to hear it. Uh, so. Mary, why don't you talk to us a little bit about Paper Doll Veronica? Okay, well that's the comic of which I'm both the artist and the writer. Other comics I'm just the artist and work with different writers. So, um, that's one that I came up with myself and it's in development and I've never done anything like it before and I've never seen another comic like it before, honestly, with the medium I'm using, so it's, it's quite a lot of fun to work on, and I hope people enjoy it. Abs <laughs> uh, absolutely, I know. Yeah, Paper Doll Veronica uh, is a fascinating comic, I have to say. I was not familiar with it till Ben told us that we were having you on for the interview, and I looked at it, and you are absolutely correct. There is nothing else like it. Uh, the art style like that was what i was going to ask you actually i am curious is the art style what it looks like as in it's not drawn per se it's put together yes it's like sort of collage only they're not stuck bound to the paper they're just placed on the paper so that they can then be moved for the next frame sounds like yeah I've, that's fascinating i've heard of it before do you go ahead ben. uh i've heard of that style before which is why i've started reading it do you take them from how much do you make yourself and how much do you source from other places well the the dolls are drawn and then um the other like the backgrounds and the clothes you use Paper uh, collected from all sorts of different things, uh, scrapbook paper, kagami, uh, anything, I, just any kind of paper I had to get my hands on, and including old uh, vintage things, and ads. I try, I try not to do much um, copying, you know, like mm. scanning in a piece and um, printing it out, but I do do a little of that. But I try to use the real paper as much as possible. And that's for the backgrounds and the clothes. And then um, like the chapter covers, they'll each have a, an image that comes from a vintage piece of paper, ephemera, that sort of thing. Um. <laughs> But the, the characters are hand-drawn, and then I put them together with brads to have their hinged limbs so that I can move them around and then stick, close onto them and stick them on the backgrounds and move them around. <laughs> so, Ben is correct. This is, uh, this is technically speaking not an entirely new idea. Ben is right, mm -hmm. so I'm curious: did you come up with it yourself, or did you see someone use it and say, "Oh man, I gotta try this"? I did see an artist um, selling paper dolls with hinges, which I hadn't seen before, and was like, "Oh, that's a good idea." I haven't seen it used in a comic before. It's it's kind of like stop motion, and I have seen animation done with a similar process. I, I haven't seen another comic that still frames like it. But if there is one, I'd be very interested in 
what they do. Afraid I haven't actually seen a comic, so his, mm -hmm. but I have seen it in like advertisements and still arts, uh, mm -hmm. and the occasional ransom note I didn't bother to answer. Uh, the, you know the usual things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely a lot like stop motion and, and um, uh, older forms of animation that like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it <laughs> helps. Uh, it gives a lot of control and. Uh, uniformity compared to some other uh, of the ones I've, I've seen because it's like you never have to worry about uh, what the uh, thing looks like mm -hmm. and, and that's both a, a, a blessing and a curse because um, you know you have the character and the char they're there you don't have to draw them again every single time and like a normal comic you draw you're drawing from panel to panel. One of the things that you go for is consistency to get the character to look the same and not like, and continuity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't have to worry about that. But at the same time, it can, it seems, it can easily get boring if you oh. just have, oh, in this panel, at least two people are standing there and in one panel, their arm is raised. In one panel, it's down. It can become like talking heads very easily. So I always want to try to find a way to um, make sure it stays lively and stays interesting by like zooming in and making sure I do a lot with gestures. Oh, yeah. That is something I noticed uh, and enjoyed quite a bit because uh, your characters are quite expressive. Most of the time, it's just kind of flat, either drawn or laid out, uh, but not much done with it. Uh, hello, Rol Nianzi. Uh, he likes the look of your project. Thank you. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very uh, flattered, and 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 I got to say, I'm very glad to be here because. Um, <clears throat> Like the whole, uh, you know, arc tunes and arc haven comics, and the movement around that. It's it's a new expression of these trends that have been going on for past few years, and and the like the rabbit puppy movement, superversive, and the pulp revolution, is what got me interested in all these things the sci-fi and fantasy people around Castalia and the surrounding. <laughs> I've read <laughs> read their blogs and read their work for a long time and <laughs> very glad to be involved. <laughs> oh yeah. And it's always fun to uh, know that at the very least <laughs> whatever might happen you're on the side uh, you know creating good art not being a moral degenerate, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, so we've talked about uh, the art and whatnot, so how did you come up with the story? Well, the first thing that, that gave me the idea for this comic was the idea of the technique, in that I was drawing another comic and it's like, it takes so long, and and then my brother jokingly said, why don't you do a sprite comic? Meaning, like, taking in the odds a lot. People used to rip sprites from video games, like the one you're playing, pixel art. Mm -hmm. And then just copy and paste them into different panels and make silly little comics like that. Yeah. And I just thought, what would be the traditional media equivalent of that? And it would be paper dolls. But, so then I was like, well, then I need a story. And so thinking about more old-fashioned paper dolls, like that little girls would play with, it's all about changing their clothes. And so um, I had the idea, oh, there's this paper doll, and her clothes change, and that has to be important. So I had the idea of that all each of her clothes, and at the point this is a, posted at ArcTunes, it has, it, 
question of, well, this wizard says he cast a spell on her clothes to give them powers. And did he or did he not? Was he just a charlatan? He's a crazy guy. Well, he really did. They are really magical and they do give her powers. And so changing the clothes of the paper doll allows her to do different things to <laughs> go on her quest to find trustworthy people <laughs> and I, don't uh, I gotta say I enjoy the sense of humor of the comic it is extremely dry <laughs> and it feels like the sort of thing that a lot of people would read and not get the joke but I see the joke <laughs> uh, <laughs> like when the animals have her early in the comic and they just have her on the ground, and one of them just very casually goes, we should strangle her. <laughs> Homicide all, frog. Like, yeah. And they're all very nonchalant about this. And also, there's a fantastic scene when the bird comes to meet her, and she's like, you're betraying me, and we've known each other for years. And the bird is like, I'm your fifth pet, and we've known each other for six months. What Thank are you, you talking about? And then he just leaves. Thank you. I, I really... It's incredibly to, dry. <laughs> I really have to credit my father for that. And he invented the character of Homicidal Frog, which is, is so far one of the most popular characters in the game. <laughs> I, I enjoy him. To be proud. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely his, my father's style of humor. And <laughs> I enjoy it, and well, I found your website and I read a little bit ahead, uh, so I kind of know the the second tier of jokes for that, which are ooh, they're funny, very enjoyable. Thank you. I I mean I think more people are reading on Arctoons than on my own website. I would recommend Arctoons if you want to read on mobile, and my website if you want to read on desktop. Um, my website is paperdollveronica.com, and on Arctoons you can find it under the fantasy genre. Uh, I do have a link down in the description <laughs> below for those who are interested. Ah, mm -hmm. And eventually Arctoons is going to catch up with my website, and then I will try to keep them running a pace. But right now my own website is further ahead. So, if you want to know the surprises, go there. Sure. I, uh, I am looking forward to Frog Alley on Arctoons. And I do like <laughs> how Arctoons is set up a bit better, just because it's, um, uh, I'm trying to think here, just because it's kind of just the entire chapter all at once. Uh, which I, I think is the, the best way to, to read it. Mm -hmm. mm. And it's also a higher resolution image, so that's Ooh. nice to look at. I do like higher resolution <laughs> images. Mm -hmm. All right. So, let's see. We've all, uh, also got you as the artist for Bovidar and the Bears. So what mm -hmm. uh, sort of led you to work on that project? Um... Well, that was, uh, that's written by Jack Mickelson, a.k.a. Laramie Hirsch, who is um, Dread Ilk and has a blog called Forge and Anvil, and I really like, I really enjoyed his blog and enjoyed his reading, and um, so actually when he started saying, I have this fantasy story, I want to turn it into a visual medium, because it, it already exists as a novel that he wrote. And he oh. wanted to do comic adaptation. And so I went ahead and said, please let me be the artist for this. Please, I want to. <laughs> because I'd read it and, and I, I really loved it. It's really exciting, old fashioned story with this adventure in this landscape that I really it's it's a fantasy landscape, but it's it's really American, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And the layout that they're going west, and they go through a desert area, and then come to a coast, and go north to the frozen lands where the polar bear, evil polar bear king, is ruling. And I just and the types of animals that they encounter is is very it's very the American wilderness and and I love to see a fantasy thing that wasn't trying to be an American's idea of some imaginary Europe. Right. You know? Europe is best left to the Europeans at this point. <laughs> and and nothing wrong with uh, fantasies in a European setting, but it's just right. really nice to see something different. <laughs> yep. And so we're working on the comic for that, and it hasn't updated in quite a while. But so far, two issues, two equivalents of issues, have gone up on Arctoons. Um, the equivalent of about fifty pages or so. But we're working on the third issue right now, and and you can see a pre few previews if you go to his the author's blog, Forge and Anvil, Laramie Harris. Um, let's see, I can put a link in the chat. Well, uh, send me, send me a link in the chat through Streamlabs. Uh, it won't let you post a okay. link in YouTube. Oh, uh, okay. Yep, yep. Let's see. He's got uh, a post recently. I'll do the the particular post that has uh, some preview images of the upcoming issue. That once we've got that in the bag, it will start posting again. Tell me, Mary, are there any possums in the story? Possums. Not playing a major role, at least. So there might be some in the in the background. Oh, of course. <laughs> Especially if 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 you prefer possums, I can try to be sure. Possums are are absolutely my favorite animal. Uh, true stalwart of the American wilderness. Mhm. Mm That's different. <laughs> I don't care for possums myself, but. What? <laughs> They killed our chickens. I mean, yeah, but... <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and, like, there's a scene... Yeah, I'm looking at both... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. There's a scene early on where it has the bear... One of the bears fighting in an arena. And it was very fun to draw all the animals who are watching. There's, like, a porcupine, there's a turkey, there's a snapping turtle... There's a uh, bobcat, <clears throat> just a lot of, a lot of different animals. <clears throat> so what were you saying? <laughs> so what I, all I was going to say was that, uh, I'm not, a, I'm not really familiar with Boda, Bodavar, is that it? Or Bovadar. Bo Bovadar. V first, V second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, V first, V second. So I wasn't as familiar with Bovadar, and I'm looking at it, and something about the way that the story is described reminds me very much of The Hobbit. Mm -hmm. Does that sound about right to you? Like, yeah. Just the way where they... the Just the general plot structure of he is at home, and he is whisked off, and if he succeeds on the adventure, he will be very rich. Mm -hmm. Like, that is obviously a vast, vast oversimplification but that is how the story describes itself in its little mm -hmm. summary and that can also apply very much to The Hobbit mm -hmm. just something I, about that plot summary makes me think of The Hobbit I would say it is reminiscent of The Hobbit <coughs> The that Hobbit I think adventure. nowadays yeah The Hobbit mm -hmm. nowadays I think after the advent of The Lord of the Rings The Hobbit comes across as weirdly refreshing in how small scale it is. And it's partially the fault of the Lord of the Rings that we don't really do that in fantasy anymore. Where it's like the stakes of the Hobbit, 
Like, yeah, okay, at the very end of the story, they do get rather large, the Battle of the Five Armies, but there's literally no inkling that this is going to be a thing until the scene happens. For the vast majority of the story, the stakes are, like, will Bilbo and the dwarfs get rich? And and I really and enjoy There's how... also... Sorry. Go ahead. How, how whimsical the Hobbit is, and, like... When the trolls are that capture them and want to eat them and such, it's uh, like what are their names? Like Tom, Dick, and Harry. And Tolkien said later, maybe I shouldn't have named him, them that. It's it's kind of juvenile. But I really enjoy the aspects of the Hobbit that are considered more juvenile, more whimsical, and try to have that sort of thing in Paper Doll Veronica. <laughs> Absolutely, I think it gives it a really refreshing feel to it. Not that I read much fantasy compared to others, but uh, I'm more of a sci-fi guy, you see. But it, it's, uh, you know, it just kind of like, ah, you know, this reminds me a lot of, like, kind of Redwall, where it's like, yes, Clooney the Scourge is coming, but first, here's a ten-page description of the feast that the <laughs> jolly woodland critters are singing songs about including loving descriptions of all the food, enough to make a man hungry. And it's like, all right, I'm here for this. I'm here for all of this. Mm, have you read that? I mean, it's a major plot point in The Hobbit. <laughs> it's true. Mm. Have you read anything? What were you anything? saying, Ben? Have you read anything like Redwall, Mary? I haven't read the first one. Um, I haven't read more than one, but um, my father, again, tell, who read them all, tells me there is a feast in every one. I mean, yes. It's the feast best part. Feast is very important. <laughs> Absolutely. Man of taste and You know culture. something else? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious if you've read this, because something else that uh, this reminded me of when I was looking at uh, Paper Doll Veronica and seeing all of the animals interacting. Have you read Watership Down? Oh, no, but I I saw the British animated film of it when I was very little. Okay. And they say, you know, it's quite it can be quite disturbing and it did scare me, but I absolutely loved it. <laughs> And, and yeah, the I film is an interesting. Mm -hmm. The film is a really interesting adaptation because it's it's a good adaptation in that like it got a lot of the essential elements down and did it right and the story makes sense, but it's also an hour and a half film of a book that is like practically epic in length, mm -hmm. and I do think that the book for that reason mainly that reason, honestly, is superior to the movie. Uh, I love, 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 love Watership Down. I think, if anything, uh, time has kind of made it underrated, in a sense. I know it was remade a couple of times very badly, that nobody liked it, because they kept completely missing the point of the story. You know, multiple times, which, uh, it was about male brotherhood and camaraderie. That is like a huge part of Watership Down, how the egos and the, uh, as well as the brotherhood of the char of the characters kind of grows over the course of the story, as well as how they clash. And everybody wants to add a female to Watership Down under the theory, I think, that, because later in the story, like, it becomes a major plot point that there are no does in their warren, and they will go, and they will die out if unless they get does, like... This is actually the plot of the story. They need to, like, find does to bring to the Warren. And it has been accused of, naturally, many, many times, of sexism over this to the point where I think it annoyed Richard Adams, the mm -hmm. author, enough that he actually wrote a sequel years later where he made sure to give, like, the female characters prominent roles. And, by the way, it's not a terrible book. It's just Tales from Watership Down. It's like a series of short stories. It is a perfectly fine little book. There's nothing wrong with it, but... Anyway, like, in the original story, it is a major plot point, and I think when people make it nowadays, besides the fact that... Do, do you watch The Critical Drinker at all, by any chance? I 
I've seen a couple. So the critical drinker has a has a running gag throughout his videos, and it's not really a gag because it's not funny. But <laughs> he refers to the message of female empowerment uh, as the message because it needs to be in everything that mm -hmm. is made nowadays. So he'll always exaggerate it as we need to make sure that we include the message. Go, and go, I think go. people, when they make Watership Down, what was that? No, just giving you some dramatic music. <laughs> 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 so, when people want to make Watership Down, they want to include the message, but the story is singularly unsuited for that, but that's the only way they can remake it, so that's kind of how they skin suit Watership Down. They'll add a female character. Now, does I think the theory behind it is does adding one doe kill the plot? Well, not in a logical sense, no. Like having a single doe or even two does if you really wanted to be uh, bold about it would still present them with the same fundamental problem later on that they need to solve, that there aren't enough does, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, in theory, more, the story but... could... Right. In theory, the story could still work if you add a doe in, which is where you get defenses from people who don't understand Watership Down. Well, come on, they just want to add a female character. Missing the fact that Watership Down, in a lot of its, uh, a lot of the story is about, like, male brotherhood and camaraderie and the egos of the various male characters mm -hmm. clashing off of each other. You know, Hazel it, like, is the leader the of the whole dynamic. Rabbits, and, yeah, exactly, but you can't acknowledge that, right? Like, uh -huh. in the modern day, you can't acknowledge that adding a woman to a group would change the dynamic, because women and men aren't different. There's <laughs> no difference between the two. So, naturally, if you ever dare to suggest that adding a woman might, in fact, change the way that the men behave, and might, in fact, change the way that the characters interact in substantial ways, which I can say from experience, it absolutely would. Like, even, not even, and I don't even mean that necessarily negatively. Like, you know, it's just a fact. It's just mm -hmm. a thing. Like, you need to account for it. You know. It's not always a bad thing. It's not always, you know. I enjoy having women, having women join groups, and the other men seem to like it, too. Even <laughs> if they are not, you know, originally a part of it. I complain. It adds a certain, uh, yeah, except men. But, no, it adds a certain class, right, to the proceedings. It does, I guess. <laughs> but it does change the dynamic. So you get these versions of Watership Down that don't ring true because part of the point of the story is how the egos of the men are bouncing off of each other throughout the story. And it's a very male-oriented story. You know, it's about leadership in a lot of mm -hmm. ways, right? But particularly a very male sort of leadership where Hazel and Bigwig are the two rabbits who are kind of jostling for the leadership position and Bigwig is a swaggering alpha. Now, you're familiar with all of the... Uh, are you familiar with the Vox Day uh, mm -hmm. alpha, beta, delta oh, terminology? Yeah. yeah. So, I could say uh, very... I could say then very succinctly that... Uh, Bigwig is a swaggering alpha in the Vox Day uh, sociosexual hierarchy mold. And Hazel is something like a delta to a beta, but who is very, very good at managing personality. And part of the arc of the story is that Bigwig learns humility. He realizes that he, even though he might be the strongest physically of the rabbits, he has to recognize that Hazel has skills and abilities that he doesn't have. And then you have General Woundwort, who is uh, sort of a foil to both of them, because General Woundwort is incredibly physically powerful and utterly fearless to the point where it is a flaw. He is like a he is like a caricature of an alpha almost. And he contrasts with Bigwig, who learns humility and Hazel. Uh, now, why did I go on this long tangent about Watership Down specifically? Well, 
one of the things about Watership Down that is so impressive is the way that it feels very distinctly animal. Mm -hmm. Like, the rabbits feel like rabbits. Now, they're actually not, though Adams claims that they are. He claims he used used a, uh, he based everything off of, like, a rabbit textbook and a specific rabbit scientist. But any any look into it at all shows that, like, it's not even close to how rabbits Mm -hmm. actually act or would think or would react to things. So, you know, like, thanks for playing. But but Adams is very good at making it seem like they're mm-hmm. rabbits. So that is my excuse for going on that tangent about Watership Down. In both Bodavar, I know you're not the writer of, or Bovadar, I know you're not the writer of Bovadar, but you are the writer of Paper Doll Veronica, so perhaps you could speak to it a little bit more there. Uh, what did you do to get your animals to seem like animals? Because I did think of Watership Down with both of these stories. Well, I didn't think about that a terrible lot. I don't know if my animals really successfully seem like animals. But I did want them to be much simpler characters than the humans. Because I do want uh, people to be able to tell a difference. And when you have, as comes in later, as this um, sort of monster of these people with animal heads that are somehow distorted in this way that they're not just people turned into animals and they're not just crazy people. So I do want that distinction to be there that you have people in you have animals and then you have this thing that we've seen the in the dark wood they encountered a man with a wolf's head and what is this thing that's neither man nor animal and it's it's not something that exists properly you know because men are men with their nature and animals are animals with their nature and this thing is not does not have a nature that is supposed to be natural, so to speak. So, I don't think I, I put enough effort, perhaps I didn't put a terrible amount of effort into think, making my animals act like animals, but um, I, I did want them to be distinctly animal as opposed to the humans. And Watership Down is definitely a book I should read and another one very good book about animals that I am ashamed that I haven't read and I definitely need to read is um, uh, Wind in the Willows and oh Wind in the Willows is a wonderful book that it has a lot of that whimsy especially that that English whimsy that we were Mm -hmm. talking about The Hobbit I think your story seems uh, more humorous seems wrong because Wind of the Willows absolutely has a sense of humor. It has a lot of humor, actually, uh, especially in the toad. The toad scenes are very funny. Mm -hmm. But your story seems more, uh, I guess, more overtly humorous than Wind in the Willows is. Mm -hmm. Wind in the Willows, I think, is very concerned in... uh, well, I, as I'm, think, I'm thinking this through, so forgive me for interrupting myself, because I'm thinking this through <laughs> and wondering if I'm right in what I'm about to say, and I don't know if I am. Because I was going to say that Wind in the Willows is uh, more concerned with creating that feeling of whimsy, as well as a feeling of, like, nostalgia for times gone by, which is really interesting, because, like, even for things that you haven't necessarily experienced yourself, Mm-hmm. But that would entirely ignore the toad sections, which are purely <laughs> comedic and are very funny. Uh, the toad sections of Wind in the Willow are absolutely of, I think, a very similar type of humor to what I'm seeing in Paper Doll Veronica. So perhaps I am wrong, and you are taking a lot of inspiration from the sense of humor of Wind in the Willows, just not the points that I think of when I think of the book. Mm-hmm. Well, like I said, I, I haven't read the book, and I'm ashamed of that. <laughs> but I, I did... When I was 
yeah, you know, I watched a, a claymation adaptation of Wind in the Willows that, uh, it was very, it was very evocative. I don't, I couldn't really speak to how good an adaptation it, it was, but it was very, the, at least the animation was quite impressive. <laughs> Yeah, Wind in the Willows is an odd little book. It's more like a series of vignettes than a novel, per se. Uh, I, it's a great book. Uh, it's, it's lovely, really, but that's kind of the best word I would have to describe it. And I think I prefer, generally speaking, the, uh, the parts with Rat and Mole and, uh, you know, on the river to Toad and, mm -hmm. you know, Toad and Toad Hall and Toad Mansion. Uh, but both of them are very well done, and I think that your preference would tend to be a matter of taste more than a matter of quality. So, they're just doing very different things. And I think the impression you would get from, like, Wind in the Willows with the stuff on the- with the stuff that takes place with Rat and Mole on the river, he's not really trying for humor so much as he's trying to create a sense of, like, you know, nostalgia and love for times gone by, and he's doing a very, I'm sure there's probably a German word for this, since there's a German <laughs> word for everything, but it's like a, almost a nostalgia for times gone by that you haven't even experienced. Mm -hmm. Like, you, but you feel like you did as yeah. you read it, and you wish you did, you wish it was all, you wish you experienced it. You know, lazy mm -hmm. days lying on the river and hanging out with friends and, you know, that feeling of coming home and seeing your home for the first time after a long absence and just, you know, not having a care in the world and being able to relax on the water. And mm -hmm. Toad Hall is just entirely different. It's, uh, it's just a tragic comedy of errors with, you know, this very funny character of Toad. And uh, it all went, and it all went well because it's a children's book, and it's all uh, it's highly amusing. And the Toad stuff, I think, got adapted more mm -hmm. because it's more immediately cinematic. Yeah, it's more cinematic. Uh, but I could definitely see some of in in Bovadar, especially. I could see, you know, the opening with Mole immediately mm -hmm. makes you think of like the mm -hmm. Willows. And then uh, the third comic, uh, which is partially my work that you can find on Artunes, is Clockwork Dancer by John De La Rose, written. That's a steampunk one mm -hmm. about uh, a scientist in Victorian Britain who has created an automaton ballerina who has her own life to her. She's more than just a robot. And that also has, and that has two issues worth up and it can also be bought in actual real paper. Uh, you can go to John De La Rose's website. You can find where to get that. And a four issue story uh, issue three is in the works, underway. So. <laughs> and <clears throat> I very much like steampunk and Victorian stuff, so that oh, allows yeah. me to play around in that world. And so if you enjoy... Steampunk is interesting to me. And oh, John I'm Delores sorry, go has, ahead. John Del Rose has his steampunk novels, um... For Steam and Country and that series. So, and a lot of people love that. And so, if you like that, please check out Clockwork Dancer. John's a. Steampunk is interesting to me. Mm -hmm. By all means, Ben, <laughs> go first. Oh, I was just <laughs> about to say that John is certainly a friend of. Uh, the Superversives, and has often promoted our work on Twitter and whatnot, and allowed me to plug Pingerin's Ghosts on his live stream. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we're always grateful to him for that stuff. Yes. 
Yeah, I was it, going to say that steampunk is an interesting genre to me because I've uh, I I like the I love the aesthetic of steampunk, mm -hmm. but if you were to ask me to name any steampunk works I actually liked, there basically are none. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe uh, Castle in the Sky, mm. the Miyazaki film. Uh -huh. Does that count? Even I'm not sure. Possibly. I mean, airships. Airships are definitely a thing, but. There isn't a whole lot of steam-powered stuff, but it's yeah, kind of diesel and, punk. And, like I was looking for steampunk comics, and a lot of them I can't stand because the characters are all so snarky all the time. Yep. <laughs> and I just don't like that. Oh, and going back, I'd like to go back to the. The idea of the whole female empowerment message thing mm. that we were talking about with Watership Down. I've, for most of my life, I've considered myself anti-feminist, but you don't realize how much of this ideology you pick up from just the culture, yep. and especially when trying to write creatively. I just pick up these conventions from other other works of fiction, especially movies uh, of that are feminist writing conventions, and shedding them has been a great boon to my creative work. For example, I used to I thought I thought I hated romance in fiction generally because I was thinking of it as well the main <clears throat> excuse me the main character and the main female they go along and they're doing their thing they're having action and adventures and things and then just suddenly out of nowhere they start making out and that's what romance is and that's how it is in a lot of movies and it's just out of nowhere and recently in reading all the reading uh, the Castalia House blog and the Superversive and the Pulp Rev movement writers, <clears throat> I realized that that is, in the terms of the socio-sexual hierarchy, that is the gamma idea of romance, of that you just, you're a friend to the woman and you just respect her and you respect how, how much she kicks butt and is just as good as a man and if you respect her hard enough, she will suddenly start making out with you. <laughs> and that's why I hated romance, because I was thinking that the gamma version of romance is how it's done. And so shedding those conventions has been extremely liberating. And I used to give male characters all these gamma traits because I thought that was, that was oh, that's gentle. That's respectful. But then I I started hating them. It's like, <laughs> what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> He's so annoying. I can't stand him. And and so, a very concrete example is in the scene in Paper La Veronica, which hasn't gone on, up on Arctoons yet, but it's in on my website. There's a scene where they're attacked by these beast-headed men. And then the beast heads runs off and Stade, the male character, says, I'll follow them. Let's see where they're going and see if they lead us to what we're looking for. And when I was first writing this scene, I, I thought, um, well, okay, then Veronica will say, okay, you do that. We'll take care of ourselves here. And I just like, wait, wait a minute. They just got attacked by monsters. Why would she say that? It makes no sense. And so I just changed the line to her saying, What? Don't leave us alone. Because just, as, just as adding one female to a group of males changes the dynamic. Adding one male to a group of females will change the dynamic to be like, they'll rely on him. They'll look to him to watch their watch out for them and protect him them and and will be quite alarmed at the idea of him 
leaving, especially when monsters just attacked. <laughs> so, and it was just very liberating to realize I had had this instinct to give her this feminist line of, okay, we can take care of ourselves. Just because of convention and because of films I had seen. And that it wasn't actually natural. And to go with what is actually natural is was much better. <laughs> I get you. And I absolutely yeah, agree with that. I, uh, I have... uh, I've got a um, character who, who's coming up for Pinkerton's Ghost. It's like, is it, you know, this blah, 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 tough? It's like, no, she's been hunted by fairies the entire time. And she's only got it because she psychotically stayed away from everyone who could ever betray her. It's like, no, I don't think the tough woman trope leads to, shall we say, a psychologically balanced life. Mm-hmm. Though, of course, I'm going to pair her up with my other misanthrope. Uh, and they together will uh, watch civilization burn from their bunker. Uh, because, <laughs> would, gosh darn it, wouldn't you know it? Uh, they have similar interests like that. Yeah, what I was going to say was I had like a very similar experience to you. And like, if you had asked me if I liked romance, I would have said no. And especially because in the modern day, for whatever reason, and I legitimately mean for whatever reason, which I'll explain in a second, like, it's not considered, like, a male category. Uh, I actually think this is historically aberrant. Like, uh, there is no reason that romance is or should have been or should be limited specifically to women, except for the fact that it's written that way a lot today. But, like, for example, if you look at eastern storytelling which men and i are both fans of uh meaning you know the translation of this is that we're weebs uh you know no anime uh, <laughs> sit, embrace it ben no. no but really though like if you look at eastern storytelling romance is absolutely not like ghetto wise towards women not even a little bit in fact mm. like many of the most popular like i'm pretty sure that at the moment the second most popular uh shonen story meaning story dedicated towards young men mm. like the 13 to 18 year age group of men currently is a romance mm -hmm. and that is its market like there is absolutely no reason that romance should be limited uh, you know no excuse to limit romance to mm -hmm. women but it's written by women for women in the west for some reason and yet uh, some of the most famous love stories in fiction are in distinctly masculine properties not properties necessarily that women don't like mm -hmm. because masculine media tends to have more of a cross-sex appeal mm -hmm. but masculine just generally like that's who they're directed towards i'm thinking of star wars of course where the han and leia romance is wonderful uh one of the best subplots in the entire series especially in empire strikes back where their chemistry is off the charts. They have some of the best dialogue in the entire series uh, and are one of the reasons that Empire Strikes Back is the best movie. And it's hard to imagine that movie without the Han Leia romance. So it's like, no, I can't really say that I dislike romance. Mm -hmm. I do like romance. It's just so rarely done well. Mm -hmm. And like Ben, I am in the process of trying to write my own romance and romance arcs in various media in both Pinkerton's Ghosts, and I'm actually writing uh, what I could really only describe as a romance novel. Uh, is that... And, uh, like, writing it... Orpheus what was that? And, is that the Orpheus and Eurydice thing? But You're famous, Anthony. I was yeah, I love him, with... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that would be it. Uh, the point being that it's been a really interesting experience to like keep in mind, like, okay, how much of what I'm writing is because of what I've imbued from pop culture, which is certainly going to be wrong and make what I'm writing worse, and how much of it is based on like act 
actual good romantic, uh, like how you write proper romantic tension. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's been kind of difficult to separate the two from each other because I think that's where you get this idea of like these really overwrought romantic scenes. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you watch like, you know, say Casablanca, which is one of the most famous romances in mm -hmm. cinema, uh, the romance in Casablanca, uh, Humphrey Bogart's character, Rick, is like, is laconic in Casablanca. He says very little. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what he does say is, screw you, I don't like you. <laughs> I also thought... As she rushes Prin into his army. <coughs> Princess of Mars. Oh, yeah. Like, a great romance-driven story of wonderful sci-fi action. <clears throat> oh, yeah. And it's... Yeah, and it's like, even though you could be like, well, the plot's just somebody kidnapped his wife again. You know, it's not like that at all. Like, it's... It's... it's Like, it's the boy's fantasy done right. Because it doesn't... He doesn't make fun of it. Uh... You get the feeling that the second they let, if they take their eyes off Deja Thoris, she's going to start sticking people with a knife she palmed when the villain had her for dinner. Uh, you know, you know, we will be married on the dawn when the Phobos comes across. It's like, okay, all right, big guy. You know, you realize that the bones <laughs> of warlords better than you have been trod underfoot. Though I did see, I did see a new John Carter comic, and oh man, is it bad! <laughs> it's bad, <laughs> like absolutely trash. I actually got myself on one of, I think, maybe it wasn't that stream, but I literally, you know, went to JDA and it's like, hey, you realize how trash this is, right? And this piece, like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like one of those things where we had a bro moment over how bad this is. Mm, sorry. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Go for it. Mm. I think another. Uh, oh, incidentally. Go ahead. Another uh, uh, archetypal romance that it's not, you know, it's not just for women. And I actually, I read. Uh, the, the Golden Ass by Apuleius as preparation for Paper Little Veronica because I kind of wanted to do these like, traveler's tales and uh, misadventures and that's a, a, a Roman story about this, this guy who gets turned into a donkey that's the, the ass of the title and then has various misadventures and what it's mostly remembered for is like the definitive version of Cupid and Psyche is told as a story within a story in it. And just Cupid and Psyche being like the foundation for Beauty and the Beast and East of the Sun, West of the Moon and all these kind of stories where <sighs> there's this sort of enchantment or something that comes in between the woman and her beloved and she has to often caused by her own mistake and she has to go on the quest to reunite with him or break the spell and and the, that's kind of a female centric story but it's not at all something that men wouldn't enjoy it's not at all feministic and it's very uh, truthful to the nature of men and women. <laughs> yep. I think, uh, you know, I think while there is a certain amount of, of cachet to making fun of the, the strong women, uh, you know, trope, I think, you know, the, the real answer to it is just to write better stories that don't rely on, on it. You know, mm -hmm. like using the models that we've had before, you know, all they're doing is writing worse stories with the bare bones of what's already been written. And since we've got, you know, 5,000 years of literature under our belts, there isn't a whole lot that hasn't been done. 
so you might as well use the best of what there is. Mm -hmm. mm. So, you mentioned Cupid and Psyche. Have you read uh, the C.S. Lewis novel, Till We Have Faces? Oh, yes. And, and that's something yeah, uh, where it's like, um, you're, one gets amazed at how well Lewis understood the female mindset. In that. Lewis himself bragged about it. Uh, uh -huh. He was very proud of Till We Have Faces. Mm -hmm. I think he, the quote from Lewis, which is kind of hilarious, by the way, is like, I am the first author to ever get into the mind of an ugly woman or something like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think he, that's, uh, that's an accurate boast. And <laughs> I can confirm he did accurately portray the mind of an ugly woman. <laughs> uh, it is kind of interesting because, like, again, it goes into things you are allowed and not allowed to acknowledge about men and women. And one of mm -hmm. the things that is absolutely true, but you're not allowed to acknowledge, is that physical appearance quite simply just is more important for women than men. Mm -hmm. It is not fair or unfair. It is just a fact, just as there are other things that are more important for men than for women. Uh, so, you know, for example, a socially awkward guy is going to be seen as creepy and weird, and a socially awkward woman is going to be seen as, like, a wallflower and some, you know, and even arguably more desirable in some senses. Just like, you know, physical, uh, physical appearance does matter more for women than men. So, he's right in that, like, okay, but I guess that's kind of, I think that's one of the reasons that Till We Have Faces is such a brilliant book in some ways, right? Like, because you, there is a question of, okay, so what if you're a woman who wants to get married but doesn't? And who wants to have children but doesn't? Because of something that is no fault of your own, you are ugly. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly the case of Till We Have Faces. And... You know, this does things to you and affects your soul in ways because we are physical beings mm -hmm. and how things affect us physically does affect our souls. You know, we are uh, hylomorphic combinations of matter and spirit, as Thomas Aquinas would say. So, nerd. In that sense, haha. Uh -huh. <laughs> in that sense, it's like. I feel like Till We Have Faces is really interesting and in getting into, like, so, you know, what is the purpose of a woman in such a state, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not really something that's addressed very often, and Lewis addresses it. Mm -hmm. And the answer he gives is, like, you know, your life is going to be very difficult, but that doesn't excuse your mistakes, and mm -hmm. yep. it doesn't excuse your sins. And then, just because your life is difficult, it doesn't mean that you know, if you don't trust that the Lord has some mystical purpose from you, then you don't understand what the gospel is saying. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it goes, it speaks to that everyone has the different sets of temptations that they have to face. And for an ugly woman, there's a very much temptation for resentment and bitterness. And, and that's one way that uh, feministic ideology in in the most poisonous sense of like hatred of men can creep in because of that bitterness and um, you talk about feminist storytelling um, the type the generally the western type of oh the strong whammon who needs no man that's at least for myself, that's not really a temptation. That's not at all alluring. But the kind that was tempting is more, and and I found this more in some Eastern things like um, the the Tale of Princess Kaguya film and uh, Revolutionary Girl Utena is this kind of feminism that's more sad and miserable and like all the men have failed yeah. and that's a, it is a I, I agree with it's you poisonous and it, it's more and I despise it's, yeah. 
<laughs> I despise the tale of the Princess Kaguya film. It is one of my least favorite movies. Uh -huh. I think that Takahata is uh, truly terrible. Like, I, I'm sorry. I hate, you know, I it's, have watched. It's so, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's visually beautiful and that makes it worse yes. because it's more insidious. It's such a mean, bitter movie. Like, there's no joy in any of it. It's just so, it's so nasty. It's so anti-men. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I've ever seen a movie that was so actively anti-men as The Tale of the Princess Kaguya. Like, it, he, Takahata kind of makes it, like, very clear in the movie that he hates men. It's just that it's all the odd. men fail her, and and it's just so sad, and it's like, ah. There's, <laughs> like, in Japan, they do have pretty broken male-to-female relations, um, but at least they kind of remember how it's supposed to look like. Yeah. You, you know, I, I look at this stuff, and it's like, you know, I, the, you know, going back to what we're saying about, like, the soul of ugly people and stuff like that, like... There's a Roald Dow quote where, I think it's him, uh, where it's like, you know, sure, there's good, ugly people, you know, beauty doesn't mean anything, but the thing is, is that if they're genuinely good people, it's going to shine through. Like, it's, I don't like to think that somebody's gonna look at uh, me or whatever and go, Ugh, you know, like, I'm not going to read his book. It's like, no, look at the cover. The cover's great. Don't look at the author. Uh, yeah, I didn't even put my picture on it. Uh, you know, that doesn't really happen. Uh, you know, the, the fortunate thing is that even though it's hard, even though it hurts, you can work to improve yourself day by day. Like, mm -hmm. even though I'm never going to win any beauty pageants with my mug, uh, because I am too highbrowed and aristocratic, you see, uh, <laughs> you know, I can still look like I'm built like a cement mixer and uh, casually lift uh, semis out of the mud, uh, you know, which in itself is a sort of male beauty virtue, you know, to be incredibly mm -hmm. strong. Like, a woman who has an unfortunate face can still work out and diet and exercise and have an absolutely amazing slim figure. You know, if she catches the right guy, he's not... Well, he's not going to ask her to put a bag over her head. Uh, but he's not going to... Like, her, her ability to improve herself, you know, will make her way more valuable in her eyes. I don't even ask people, you know, like, what do you look like or whatever. I, I ask if they work out, you mm -hmm. know, like, because even if you just kind of play at it, the skills and tools are there to do more later. And, and, and one thing that's uh, an important discovery is about ugliness is that, and this, I think Rodal also said it in this quote you were talking about, that, but if you have ugly thoughts and ugly uh and ugly on the inside it will show through yep. and that you see people who like like george soros and hillary clinton who have done <laughs> evil things in their life and they are there is an ugliness that shows yep. physically and it is different from the type type of ugliness that just happens from not very yeah there's yep th you're absolutely right and there's something else to think of too it's like there are people who first off you could not pay me money to tell you who i'm talking about and i never would in a million years but there are people who i know who are not like that physically attractive if you were to meet them and talk to them and they are lovely wonderful people who i know personally and when you talk to them you are not thinking at any point to yourself, like, this is just not a very attractive person. Like, the, their physical appearance is not the thing that comes up in your head, right? Like, mm -hmm. you, it just doesn't, it's not something that you're going to focus on. You're going to focus on, if you were to bring up their name, you think of them and you think, oh, they're wonderful, you know, they're lovely people. But, like, Hillary Clinton, I think of, and I think, oh, yeah, the butch lesbian. 
Uh, <laughs> Who was the crypt keeper in? Oh, part I'm of sorry, this is, Bill. <laughs> right. And part of this is because Hillary Clinton is a person who is ugly on the inside. Like, or, you know, Elizabeth Warren is another example. Now, Elizabeth Warren is older, obviously, but there is no reason to think of her as an ugly woman, per se, right? Like, if you just hmm. described her physically, just an older woman, you know, that's a different thing. Like, she's aged. Yeah, okay, it happens. We've all seen those But people I think church. of Elizabeth Warren, and I think Carpy, and mm -hmm. I think that's a really ugly woman, and it's because... Elizabeth Warren has ugly thoughts that express themselves in ugly ways, you know, and that's what comes across to me. Dalrock, uh, the whose blog ended mm -hmm. years ago, he was one of the, for people who don't know him, uh, he had a great website from years ago, uh, sadly it ended, but he would talk about this often on his website, where he would say that feminism makes you ugly. Mm -hmm. where he was like he and it's so funny because he had this reputation as like you know one of the manosphere authors in the manosphere had this bad reputation but dalrock was very open to like the spiritual side of it where he would be like you know there is a spiritual dimension to this where feminism makes you ugly even if mm -hmm. you would otherwise be physically attractive and if you have a gentle and kind and loving spirit that makes you more attractive even if physically you might not be as obviously attractive mm -hmm. you know and he was absolutely correct like it shows you can see it mm -hmm. yep and i can see and so mm. that's why um that's one of the truth in fairy tales and 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 uh because you have the beautiful princesses and the ugly witches and children get taught nowadays oh that's wrong that's that's wicked. That's privilege. Don't believe that. Don't ever judge people by appearances. But there is this, there is this type of ugliness that does correlate to wickedness, and there is a beauty that comes from goodness in of itself. Yep. <laughs> and, it, yeah. There's, you know, the thing is, is that like. Uh, the old prohibition thing lips that touch alcohol will never touch ours and it's like oh, I um, thank god thank you <laughs> yeah and i i'm working with a lot of big paper doll veronica i've got a lot of fairy tales that i'm trying to allude to like we have the three sisters uh yep. that's referring to the fairy tale of little one eyes, little two eyes, and little three eyes. But it's kind of different in that I have, and in that fairy tale, you had these three sisters, and it was, and it's, oh gosh, it's kind of like till how we have, we, ah, sorry, till we have faces, in that I'm kind of rehabilitating an ugly stepsister. In the original fairy tale, little one eyes and little three eyes were always very mean to little two eyes, and they were the, her, her mean sisters. But I'm trying to portray as like, well, they're not really mean, but they have they do fight, like real sisters fight over emotional issues, and oh, the mother liked you best. Oh, she just wanted us to feel human, <laughs> and that sort of thing. Um, but I'm trying to do it like Lewis in a way that is not subversive. <clears throat> uh, because, um... Yeah, Lewis, uh, Lewis treads a very tricky balance until we have faces where he tells the story from the point of view of the evil stepsister now of, you know, Psyche, or the evil sister actually in that case of Psyche. Uh, it's interesting because I know that John C. Wright wrote a review of or at least like a more reaction to Till We Have Faces, where he said he didn't like it very much, and he explained that it wasn't necessarily due to the quality. He could understand objectively that it was a good book that accomplished what Lewis set out to do and made a legitimate and profound point, but that he did not like it. Mm -hmm. So, and that's fair, right? Like, that happens. I've said the same thing about Gene Wolf before where I could recognize that Gene Wolfe is a brilliant author 
and I just happen not to enjoy him. So, you know, that's that's perfectly fair. But one of the things that he did not like was that he could not empathize at all with the with the main character, Orwell. <laughs> and he said that the reason he could not empathize with her is that envy and jealousy were simply not sins he struggled with. He ah. struggled he John said I struggled with wrath. I did not, and he goes, and there are stories of a similar type in some ways, like Gran Torino, with uh, the movie with Clint Eastwood, which, by the way, great movie, he's right. He goes, that character, even though it's a similarly, in some ways, ugly film, like, that, that character I could totally empathize with, I get it, right? Mm -hmm. But Orwell, I could not empathize with. Uh, so... It's funny you say that because I found Orwell incredibly sympathetic when I read mm -hmm. it. And Me like too. not so much that I had any experience that was particularly like Orwell's. I have thankfully not. Because uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> she lived quite a difficult life. But more that this idea that th this temptation that we have to blame the bad things that have happening on the gods, right? the mm -hmm. fault in our stars i think it's something that i could absolutely empathize with because it's very very easy to do it's the tendency you really need to reach a level of mastery in your spiritual life to truly recognize that the bad things that happen you know is not the fault of god yeah. right it's yeah it's one of those things where I, I feel very blessed that I, I kind of, I don't know if I'd say got over it, but, like, I accepted that sometimes I deserve my consequences for my terrible actions. Now, don't get me wrong. I've played, prayed plenty of times, Lord, please don't give me the consequences of my actions, please. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. But it, it's, it's, um... You know, it's kind of like the problem of evil and other things like that. I recognize the suffering I went through as a child was a result of people being sinful people who mm -hmm. I had to love. And, you know, to, to shorten a 25-year epic story arc, uh, you know, eventually when I gave up that anger you know, a whole lot of, like, character development was unlocked. Like, the sins that we carry in our breast that keep us there, there's always one or two primary sins. But when you start to, to get over those humps, like, immediately it's like, okay, great. Now here's five more sins to work on. <laughs> but, you know, it's not as bad. It's bad. It's always going to be, like, equally bad. And we are not deserving of the grace that God gives us, you know, through Jesus Christ. But, you know, he is, you know, he, he provides us this help, this, this, this soulful knowledge. And, you know, he does have many promises for those of us, you know, who suffer, whether because they're ugly as sin, uh, even though they're beautiful on the inside, or, you know, they have something like wrath uh, or, or other things in their heart. You know, there's repair state you know like god will you know there's bomb and gilead you know it's mm -hmm. there's you know there's hope beyond uh our deaths that we can cling to even in our darkest moments like looking in a mirror mm -hmm. uh, that brings two things to mind <laughs> uh first it's uh, another comic on that you can read on our tunes that I'd like to recommend. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Chateau Grief. Mm -hmm. And I had been, I had been following it on, on DeviantArt for a long time. And then when it came to Arctoons, I was so excited to, to see someone, oh, someone I know is putting stuff on there. But it has this scene. I mean, in it, it's a very strange premise that there's this island off of California that is ruled by this telepathic man who used to work for the military. And, and he can read the thoughts of everyone on the island. 
and he has telekinesis and he can heal wounds, he can create things, he can do, he seems nearly omnipotent. And the people of the island hate him. And it's clear that, that a lot of the stuff, their feelings towards him are a lot like a lot of people's feelings towards God, of, of blaming him for everything that all the misfortune in their lives. And yet, but he's just a fallible, very flawed man. He's not God, but there's this one scene, I don't know if it, it probably hasn't gone up on our kids yet, that I really loved where there's been a riot against his rule and he's talking to one of the leaders of the rebels and he says, what do you want? Do you want an endless supply of food? Do you want all your diseases and your wounds healed? Do you want to always, to never feel the emotion of sadness? Do you want this and that? What do you want? And she says that she wants him to fix the windows that they broke in the riot. And you just realize that's what people want from God. They want to escape the natural consequences of their own actions. Yep. <laughs> and so I can recommend that comic. And and the other thing that it's it's like and, and to a certain extent God does enable us to uh, escape the consequences of our actions in that He offers forgiveness of sin through the sacrifice of the cross mm -hmm. but he also he doesn't totally take away the consequences of our actions in that he allows us to participate in that sacrifice through our actions and it was brought about through wicked actions of the Sanhedrin and Judas and, and the Romans and everything and I and the whole doctrine of temporal punishment um, in the Catholic Church is about how sin damages reality, and that damage has to be endured one way or another. And even though, but at the same time, God does uh, does shield us from that damage more than we deserve. You know, yeah, and, and that temporal punishment can come upon you from other people's sins, and that you can take it unwillingly, or just that the bad things that happen might be caused by someone's sins. Oh, mo most bad things that happen in life are caused by someone's sins, <clears throat> and I have a, I have something coming up in Paper Doll Veronica later that. They travel to a country where there are sentences for crimes uh, that carry on from generation to generation. It's not just the original criminal who gets sentenced, but their descendants as well uh, suffer a punishment for the crime. And Veronica is shocked. She's like, but, but you didn't do anything talking to someone whose ancestor was sentenced for a crime. And he says, but these things have an effect. And he says, if, if parents break the windows in winter, the children will also feel the cold. And that our actions will have effect on other people, even if they're innocent. And that, that's part of reality. So yep. that, that's what's brought to my... <clears throat> Fortunately, it's one of those things where the more good we do, the more it sticks around. Uh, mm -hmm. But evil, especially active evil, can be stopped when the person stops doing evil. Uh, mm -hmm. Though it may seem, you know, like there's a lot of damage. Oh, that's a lot of, like, state can't fix this. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, not just about that. It's, it's more about the fact that... Um, I'm trying, trying to think through my words here, is that evil needs to be upkept, right? Like, the someone needs to keep breaking the windows. But somebody who's cleaning the windows, well, that just keeps the good of the windows going forever. Well, as long as, you know, no one comes and breaks the windows. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Like, 
we could, you know, dwell on the evil that people have done us forever, which is a very ugly thought. Uh, you know, I'm sure some of my weird forehead creases, I have two diagonal lines pointing down to the bridge of my nose that I can't, like, there's clearly, like, disgust lines, crow's feet, all that stuff. I can't figure out why I've got two diagonal crests down the, the, my forehead. And it's certainly from thinking too hard on such things. <laughs> and, you know, the wrongs done to me or whatever. If, if, if facial, uh, you know, if, if our actions do show through our faces. But I don't have to do that continuously. I could, as I did, you know, forgive. And I could just move on with my life. And I could, you know, do things that benefit others. And not punish the people who, who you know, hurt me or others or whatever. And instead treat them as a Christian. Uh, like, I'm not a Catholic, as, as is a painfully obvious, uh, I'm sure, to any fan of the show, all three of you. But it's, it's, you know, even though I say, you know, once, you know, for all, sola fides and all that good stuff, you know, I still believe that a Christian is shown by his good works. Now that they save him. But that any Christian that you know will have good works. Uh, you know, even if nobody's looking at you, nobody's doing anything about it, um, you know, there will be clear signs that this person is a Christian. Mm -hmm. If you know them. So then, hmm? how do you feel about the shopping cart morality test? I was posting the shopping cart morality test before you, Anthony. Uh, no, it's absolutely true. You think you can post a meme to me that I have not foreseen and seen? Uh, the next meme stock will be uh, NFTs connected directly to... Uh, hold on, it's coming in from Aldebaran. It's NFTs connected to taxidermied pets. Anyway. Oh, and then... I'd like to clarify that I'm not positing the idea of generational punishments for crime as an ideal. It's more of a, a, a thought experiment. Right. No, no, I, <laughs> I didn't think anything of that. Uh, but the, uh, going back to, you know, actually answering Anthony's question, the shopping cart morality test is absolutely true. Um, and it should be treated very seriously. Uh, the idea that people doing good without re direct reward or being seen is a sign that somebody is fundamentally good. Somebody who wants to be rewarded for their good, and speaking from experience here, every single one of them has made it very obvious that they were the ones, and then they act flattered when you thank them for it. Now, of course, you know, like there's, what I'm talking about is pride. You know, a humble person will go, oh, it was nothing, or, and I don't mean, oh, it was nothing, you know, praise me more. No, it's like, oh, it's just something I did, you know, like, it's literally, you know, brush it off, bro, you know, there's some other thing we have to do, don't worry about it. Um, you know, but the shopping cart morality test, you know, I've done that thing where you pay it forward and then watch somebody look at my cart, take out the quarter, and pocket it. At Aldi's, you know, you put it in a quarter, it unlocks the cart, and you can drive around with the cart. It's great. Uh, and it's like, that's a failure of the shopping cart. Um, that might have been a little bit of wrath on my part, too, because it's like, come on, what's wrong with you? But, I can forgive. But it's absolutely true. The things that you do when no one's watching, you know, what you are in the dark is more important than what you are in front of other people. Like, I, I know that Catholics have a different system, but like in the church, you know, there are people who want to be elders. They have no right, they have no business being anything of an elder in the church. You know, like somebody who is a spiritual leader but not the pastor. Uh, you know, and part of it is the sign that is like, you know, 
they want it. That's part of the problem. Or they're trying to answer a spiritual need that's not there. Or they're just a jerk. You know, or their kids have fallen away from, from uh, you know, Christianity. If there's a thousand little reasons that will be evident that this person has no business being an elder. Mm-hmm. Mm. And in, in the Catholic milieu, it's kind of a, uh, a recurring thing that you read about stories of saints. That the, they want to make him a bishop. He doesn't want to be a bishop. He runs away. <laughs> right. Wasn't yeah. there a pope like that? And then they dragged him in. And then they are like, they, I think they assassinated him or something. Because he was making too many reforms. Or I, I can't really remember what it was. There are many popes like that. Point is, is that they brought him in to reform it. And then they hated him for it. <laughs> yeah, that happens. Or it is the St. Benedict brought to reform the monks, and oh, they don't like it, they try to poison him. <laughs> <laughs> you can never tell what poison Yeah, there. <laughs> Honestly, the number of stories multiplies uh, when you think it over. St. John of the Cross, mm-hmm. similar thing happened with him. I don't think they explicitly tried to kill him, but like they did kidnap him. For a good long while, because he was reforming the Carmelite order, and uh, he was very strict, and he was actually like following the lead of Saint Ter- Teresa of Avila, who mm-hmm. was also reforming the female branch of the Carmelites. So he was like using a lot of her reforms, and uh, they did not like that he was reforming the Carmelite order to be more strict. So they kidnapped him, and while he was kidnapped, he wrote his uh, spiritual masterpiece, the long poem, The Dark Knight of the Soul. I believe he Mm -hmm. wrote that during his kidnapping. Mm -hmm. Uh, Coincidence? Probably not. (laughs) (laughs) That that was the period when he wrote that poem. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the stories multiply. Happens quite a bit. And that that goes back to the whole art out of pain, and that and deeper, um, God bringing good out of evil. Yep. And so we talk about the consequences of evil actions that, like the, the cross, God can bring great good, he can make great good to be a consequence of evil actions. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, one of the great Christian, uh, the Christ, one of the great Christian paradoxes is the Felix Culpa, right? You know, uh, where you go, oh, happy fall. It's a very difficult thing to grasp, but I think that the way to grasp this idea of, you know, being thankful for a fault that leads to so great a redeemer is to think of the cross and that we use the cross as our central symbol, you know, of Christianity, right? Mm-hmm. That is, is the ultimate felix culpa right Mm -hmm. it is the ultimate sin the killing of god uh the killing of the ultimate good and if that had not happened then we would have had no resurrection Mm -hmm. so we honor the cross Mm -hmm. it's kind of the central (laughs) that's the that's the christian answer to suffering right Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess that's what you would say. Like, the, the answer, the Christian answer to suffering is the cross. There was a great book by a Christian author uh, named Stephen Lawhead, and I call him a Christian author, even though he published with mainstream publishers, but he had a book called Byzantium that was about a monk who gets kidnapped by, who was tasked to bring a certain copy of the Bible to Byzantium and the emperor, and he travels, he gets kidnapped by Vikings, and then he ends up, like, traveling with the group of Vikings, and the Vikings get imprisoned and then escape the prison. It's a whole epic historical story, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But by the end of the book, our main character, the monk, has lost his faith, and the Vikings have converted. Uh, And the Vikings answer, he goes, you see there are various scenes in the story where he becomes like more and more impressed with the god of the Christians. And at the end of the story... He says something to the monk that kind of snaps the monk out of it. He goes, you know, when we were in prison, 
he goes, I was thinking of, like, what gods to call on. And then I was thinking, but Thor wouldn't understand. He's like, how, you know, Thor has no idea what it's like. Odin doesn't know. Yeah. He goes, but then I look at the cross, and they say, ah, but he knows. Mm-hmm. Nice. And uh, that's kind of the thing that snaps him out of it. Like, that's our answer to the prob- That's our answer to the problem of evil. I can't believe they let him publish that. Honestly, like, oh wow. He was a uh, pretty openly, uh, pretty openly Christian author. Anyway, Stephen Lawhead's fantastic. Uh, I think he's published with mainstream publishers. I don't think he's like an indie guy. Like, you could buy his books in stores. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, like, here, they're very, very openly Christian, and they're all fantastic. And, uh, yeah, that scene in Byzantium, I just remember that line, like, as striking mm-hmm. me, where, you know, this is the thing that convinced the Vikings, right? We, it's one of those funny things about people who try and warp paganism and go, like, mm-hmm. the Vikings all converted to Christianity. <laughs> Uh-huh. It's like, why do you think the Vikings are gone? Because they converted. And yeah. even that's not entirely true, because many of the Vikings were Christians, like, for example, Erickson and Eric the Red. Uh, yep. the, Leif Erickson was a Christian. That's the first time I've heard that, but I absolutely believe it, because he is at the time when, you know, monks and, uh, you know, uh, missionaries and whatnot were absolutely all over the place. And that that line reminds me of a a quote from P.K. Chesterton, where he's talking about the the cry from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that there's no other religion where God felt like an atheist. (laughs) in that sense that he god experienced abandonment of yeah. god also by the way <laughs> for the record then mm-hmm. yes leif erickson was definitely christian this is not speculation it's actually a pretty large part of the backstory i just double checked this yeah no no i, I believe sure. you like he converted his mother you think yeah. I no, no, no I'm, source? I was yeah, just wondering, because now you said that, but I, the, now that you said that, I want to double check, and as it turns out, it's like, no, this is not just something you speculate on, like, this is actually a large part of Leif Erikson's backstory. Uh, and he was a <laughs> like, man of power. part of what he was doing was trying, what was that? And he was a man of power, you know, he lived a very active and, and, and just you know, very, this is no way to put it, like, he was a very active man, you know, he, he set his will to things and accomplished great feats, uh, that are worth remembering, like, it was, he wasn't just some sappy, you know, scholar pagan or whatever, he was a full-on adventurer, and a man worth, uh, setting yourself after. Uh, Mary, though, please continue. Yeah, incidentally, like, go ahead. Well, what what you were saying earlier. Uh Uh-huh. So that Chesterton pointed out that only only the Christian God knows the absolute depth of human suffering and desolation in this way. And for that, that, a good expression of that answer to the problem of evil is his very strange novel, The Man Who Is Thursday. It's just feds all the way down. (laughs) Yeah, that's one thing. But, strangely enough, they are actually good heroic feds. Oh. Who are fighting for... uh, Christian civilization. (laughs) Sure. So, that's a, a very... A book I'd recommend to everyone. It's, it's strange and confusing, but it's a very, very beautiful book. Oh, it's a fantastic novel. Yeah, uh, The Man Who Was Thursday, it's very interesting. Uh, first, it's one of the funniest books I've ever read. It's actually hysterical. Uh, 
like under the radar. It's kind of under the radar hysterical. Like that's not talked about enough. I think the fact that it's actually like that book and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy are the two funniest books I've ever read. Uh, so it's very very fun. But the ending of the book is like you know I've seen people say that it is both its biggest strength and its biggest weakness. And I think I would agree with that because the end of the book is very, very weird. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you probably will. Like, on the first read through, I was just confused. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard not to be confused reading uh -huh. it, honestly. And I think it's part of the reason, like, the man who was Thursday has never really been considered, like, a masterwork by anyone it's never reached the level of like the great works of fiction and i think that i would agree with that you know like i would tend to agree with that assessment like i enjoy uh the man who was thursday i think it is a profound book in many ways and a hilarious book but would i put it on the level of you know the capital g great works and has chesterton ever produced anything like that mm. And that I would say no. And part of the reason for that is that he didn't really know how to end it. There's also the fact that just scope wise, I don't think it quite hits that level either. You know, there's that as well. That's like, a, it just doesn't really have the scope. That's a whole debate that could be had. Um, and I might argue on the other side in such a debate, but one point I would concede is that he is a bit, well, I, I very much doubt he would have ever thought that he would be a great author or presumed to such a thing or had such a Oh, ambition. I think Chester Tan is a yeah. genius. Uh, but, like, to um, be clear, this is not even really a just, criticism. This yeah. is like a five of five novel. But. Uh -huh. oh, but he just considers himself, oh, I'm just a journalist. But, um, the one point I would consider that uh, uh, it limits the timelessness of his work is that he's very, he does refer very much to current events of when he was writing and that people later might not know what he's talking about. Like, uh, I remember uh, references to the Boer War and that kind of thing. <laughs> That yeah. Might understand. I would tend to consider the last capital G great work, and you know, by that I'm referring to like you know, it mm -hmm. makes an impact on civilization and will live mm -hmm. down through the ages. Although to be fair, we cannot confirm the latter point yet. But mm -hmm. I would, you know, I'm making a prediction. I would consider it to be the Lord of the Rings in English, mm -hmm. at least. Uh. I think you could make the argument that it's the only work in English that counts among the capital G great works, though I am not wed to that, to be clear. Like, I am not, uh, I am not willing to make that argument strongly. That? Like, if somebody were to bring up, you know, counterpoints, uh, then I could see myself conceding it. I but I think can't the, think of uh, any. Well, the, I think the obvious counterpoint would be Shakespeare. Um, I guess some of the tra yeah, I guess some of the tragedies. Yeah, I would say that, like that I would, I would definitely argue for King Lear. I'm partial. The... <laughs> yeah, I'm partial to Othello, which I think is wildly misunderstood by just about everybody. <laughs> uh, as are most Shakespeare, most Shakespeare plays are, to be honest mm. with you. Like, I, Othello, I have a pet peeve with Othello, which is that Othello was not a particularly jealous person, and uh, jealousy was not his main flaw. Mm -hmm. And it's always annoyed me that people tried to make it a story about jealousy, uh, when Othello did not want to accuse his wife, and tried to look for excuses not to believe that his wife was cheating on him, and was only convinced after an elaborate hoax by Yako. So it's one of those things where 
It's sort of like when well, people try and tell me that the thing, the movie The Thing by John Carpenter is about paranoia, to which I respond, <laughs> what were they paranoid about? It was about entirely rational fear. <laughs> like, there is nothing to be, like, so there was a shapeshifter among them who could have been any of them, and they reacted to it in an entirely sane and rational way. Like, there's no paranoia in the thing. <laughs> But, uh, did I derail? Were you driving at, with Lord of the Rings as a candidate for great work in English? One more time. Uh, did I derail the point you were making about the Lord of the Rings? No, no, I think, uh, I think you're right. It was just something I couldn't think of. Like, I go, oh yeah, Shakespeare, the, <laughs> the tragedy I would put. <laughs> I can't really argue with that. Uh, the point I was making more was that, uh, in terms of, like, I think that the Lord of the Rings, I would put on that list, because Lord of the Rings, uh, it has the scope. You know, it is mm -hmm. about humanity in a very real way. It has the ambition. It seems like it's going to have the staying power, and I think it has the objective quality. Like, I don't think it's enough to have the objective quality and the scope. I think that, like, part of the definition is that you need to have the staying power. Like, without that, then you can't put, for example, like, you know, I mentioned what candidates are there nowadays. I go, well, I would say, and I think Ben would agree to a certain point would be like John C. Wright's Awake in the Nightland uh, is yeah. an absolute masterwork in objective quality. I do think that there are moments where it reaches the heights of the Lord of the Rings, although I am not sure if it surpasses it, but I think it gets close. However, Awake in the Nightland, because of its subject matter, I think inherently limits itself. Mm -hmm. It won't reach, like, the, the wide enough audience to ever be part of the capital G Great Works, even though, from an objective quality standpoint, it is certainly close. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a difficulty that we have in the current uh, climate of literature is that the things that are reaching the huge audiences are the the skin suits, you know? Yep. So, yeah, Ready Player One. Will, will this era produce any great works because the things that are objectively really, really good are reaching quite small audiences? Well, so, it's... Only it's... the future can tell us. Right, and like we're talking about what our grandchildren will think of us, you know, as mm -hmm. we, we try to, to say it'll, it'll be John or it'll be, you know, me or Anthony or you or whatever. But in reality, we'll, we won't receive any, any joy of that. Um, you know, instead, what will happen is, is that we'll work our entire lives for God's glory. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. Don't, you know, I'm not doom and glooming here, but we won't know for such a long time that whether or not the things we did were the right things and were, you know, the, the, as good as we thought them, you know, it might be that, old, you know, like some, some random dude, you know, we don't think much of now, you know, will be the one who's remembered as the master worker, but then it's like, you know, Ben, who, you know, Ben Wheel, who's that? You know, who, who's this ale, you know, sort of thing. And, it, you know, it, and it won't matter how many hours I've spent on this, you know, what, what we've done, what mastery we have achieved. You know, we'll just be somebody else's foot in it, print. It's like, um, what's a good example of that? Like Hodgson himself in the Nightlands. You know, but there, are, there were a ton of pulp writers who wrote the same works as, as Robert Howard and Lovecraft and all that jazz. You know, but we just don't remember them the same way that we do. Now, they were also the Chads of their era, especially Lovecraft. But, <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a different sort of thing. Well, well and it hmm? reminds me of a, a blog post by John C. Wright that was a major, major motivation and inspiration for me. It's, I think it's called Your Book of Gold where he's talking about you might oh, write yeah. a book and, and maybe no 
only 10 people will read it, but to someone, it will be a window to a world of wonder and it will inspire them. And when you meet in heaven, the gratitude, I'm tearing up because it's such a, it's a great post. It is. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it's something that Ben and I have like talked about kind of with our personal lives for a while where the key that we need to keep in mind is why we're doing things. Yep. And like this whole, like, like the idea of are we doing the right thing or the wrong thing is almost secondary. It's like, you know, it causes decision, like, which is weird to say, but what I mean is like, it causes decision paralysis, right? Yep. Like we don't, you know, we, we try and do something or we try and figure out what decision to make, but it's secondary to like, okay, even if it's the wrong decision, ultimately, I need to trust that if I am doing it for God, that God is going to make it work out right. Like, this was yep. a thing with, you know, decisions we were making in our personal lives for both of us at various times. We were like, okay, should we do this or should we do that? Or is this the right thing to do? And then the answer is, even if it's the wrong thing to do, if you're doing it for God, then God's going to make it come out right, ultimately. Yep. So... I think of it that way with the writing as well. Like, are we ever going to reach an audience in our life? Well, no, but we're writing for the right reasons, right? We're mm -hmm. writing to create art and we're writing to build the culture. That's part of the superversive fiction movement. So whether that happens in a way that we can foresee, you know, we are men of faith and we have faith that it's all going to work towards the good even yep. if it's in a way we don't understand right now. I'm clueless. The, <laughs> the analogy that we've used to uh, another way of looking at that's a little bit more concrete maybe and uh, perhaps more optimistic for a certain type of person is we're building a cathedral. And the people who built cathedrals started them knowing that they would be long dead and perhaps even their children and children's children would be long dead before the cathedrals were finished. They could take 800 years from start to finish in certain extreme cases. Certainly they could take 50, 100 years, you know? Yep. And they started those cathedrals knowing that they were going to be creating a legacy for their grandchildren and trusting in their faith in, their, in God and their own abilities to get that, that they're creating something beautiful. So I think that's part of what we need to do as well. Like, will we ever find, you know, Ben and I and Ken as well are always on the eternal quest to find audience for Pinkerton's ghosts. Now, I'm not going to say that it's never going to happen that we'll find that audience and suddenly we'll hit big. It absolutely might. And we are not going to stop trying. However, I think that all three of us are agreed that even if we go through all five seasons and it never does hit big and we never do find that audiences, never for a second would I regret any second that I've spent on Pinkerton's Ghosts. Yep. Because I know why I'm doing it. I understand the reasons for it. And we're doing it for the right reasons. It's cathedral building in a sense. Right? Like, yep. it's a story that I believe in and it's work that I believe in. And even if it does not work out in the immediate here and now, I trust that because of because we're doing it to build the culture for God, for art, that we put the effort in, that we put the work in, that we did it the right way. And we are. We're doing it the right way. That it is going to work out for the good in some way, even if it's not something that we can understand immediately. Yep. And again, this is not me black killing. I'm not even saying that, like, mm -hmm. we're not going to find that audience because we're working on it and we're going to keep trying. Mm -hmm. And certainly we're not going to give up. Yeah. But mm -hmm. what I am saying is that for, it is possible that the fruits of Pinkerton's ghost will not be immediately obvious to us. But I have to trust, and I do trust, that those fruits are real. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And they certainly are. And I mean, you take you take Tolkien, who 
you know, started uh, creating his whole world of mythology in in the early 20th century, and then he couldn't get. He had the Silmarillion first, but he couldn't get it published, and eventually published The Hobbit, and then The Lord of the Rings, and then the Silmarillion wasn't published until after his death, even though it was the foundation of all of it. And But he kept working on it, and he put so much work into it, and now it's... it's uh, <clears throat> In candidate for the, the great works of literature and it had a tremendous impact on thousands of people and yep. there you are <laughs> there's the uh tolkien has an incredible short story uh, i think i recall mm -hmm. i want to say one of the tolkien scholars like shippy maybe uh said and i agree with him it was one of it's under the radar not respected enough like it's one of the finest short stories of the 20th century his masterpiece of leaf by nickel uh -huh. and leaf by nickel really does get at exactly what we're talking about like mm -hmm. tolkien totally understood right he did not understand he never grasped that lord of the rings was a masterwork i don't think tolkien ever fully understood that i think he always was kind of disappointed in how the Lord of the Rings turned out. Like, oh, not that he thought that it turned out badly, <laughs> but he thought that it was incomplete. Like, and that this shouldn't, you know, this wasn't the masterwork. This was a lesser work, right? Like, and people were treating it like a masterwork, right? It's like so, somebody found my high school scribbles. Wow, amazing. It's like cringing from heaven. <laughs> no, please. I don't think, yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't say it was exactly that. It was more like when Tolkien finished The Lord of the Rings, he knew it was good, and he liked it. But this was like, the Silmarillion was his masterpiece, you know? Yeah. And The Lord of the Rings was a book that he worked very hard on, but it was not the masterpiece, but people were treating it that way. Leave by Niggle is kind of, like, it's amazing that he wrote that work in his 20s. Like, it is truly, there is something God touched about Leaf by Niggle. Because it so eerily accurately gets at, like, Tolkien's entire career as an author, you know, of, cre of creating this one painting and only the leaf is mastered. And that leaf inspires people. But then when he dies, he goes and he sees the forest. And the forest is what, and that leaf and Niggle's forest is used to greet people into the mountains, right? as they see the mountains it's such a beautiful story and the fact that tolkien wrote that in his 20s is just mind-blowing because it truly feels like the work of somebody who is reflecting on their career and it is not <laughs> it is the work of somebody who was just starting their career but i guess tolkien had this idea right it's of how of he thought and worked. <laughs> yeah I guess he knew how his brain worked, right? And how he thought and that he, you know, he saw Niggle in himself. And that's, uh, yeah, that's something like, I think we need to keep in mind as well that maybe, you know, one day we'll die and we'll be face to face and we'll see the forest of our work. And then we'll be told that, you know, and we'll be disappointed because we didn't create what we wanted, but God's ways are not our ways, you know. I like to bring up, you know, maybe your life, you know, we think that we're called to do these things, but maybe you'll be called to die in your 20s and to never leave, you know, one building for the majority of your life and never talk to anyone and to write in journals for most of what you do. And then maybe you'll be St. Teresa of Lasau. You know, like maybe that's your calling, or maybe you'll get imprisoned and you'll die in a pit, starve to death, injected, and uh, you'll die young and you'll have no writings left behind, or almost no writings, very few. And maybe you'll be Saint Maximilian Colby. Like, we don't, you know, our ways are not God's ways. Yep. And it, there's, you know, there's a, there was a pastor, a uh, Iranian pastor, who was thrown into a pit, and they would break. They, they actually wanted to keep him alive, uh, you know, just so to see if they could break him. 
and eventually they just left him in there for a very inhumanly long time. And when he came out, he astounded them because his response wasn't, oh, thank you, you know, sunlight, oh, it was, put me back in the pit. I was close to God there. You know, it's, it's, you know, not that we are to seek out suffering or anything like that. I've never endorsed ma spiritual masochism. But, you know, our eyes can't be on, you know, our, our circumstances. You know, I'm sure, you know, as, as guys anyway, both Anthony and I go, ah, we could use more money. We could use a wife. We could use, you know, kids. We could use, um, you know, a new car. We could use all the BS of life, you know. Both of us drive very humble vehicles. Uh, though, mm -hmm. I have discovered that, you know, my sweet little Honda uh, has some of the best gas mileage on the planet. So, <laughs> you know what, thank you know, that's the Lord uh, and my mechanic. But it's, 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 it's not that. Life's not that. And our work before God is not that. Ultimately, you know, I'm still going to keep writing. Mm. Mary, why don't you give us a final word? And then we'll talk about well, the comments. Okay. Um, going back to that post from uh, John C. Wright that says that, um, well, you might only write one book, but it will inspire someone. And that he mentioned that Veronica did the simple act of compassion, wiping Christ's face with her veil. And for that, she is a saint. And I just want to say that um that is very very crucial to the meaning of what i'm trying to do and that the fact that um, the main character is named veronica is no coincidence and that's the <laughs> a hint for what's to come fantastic we're certainly looking forward to it let's go over the comments real quick Hello, every... Oh, wow. You guys really went for it. Fantastic. Uh, let's see here. Hello, Raul. Hello, Ardenon. Uh, Raul Nancy, you derive drama from simple things like some animals commandeer a girl's house. Somehow it works. Um, it's mostly homicidal frog. When that... Like, he's, he's quick with a switchblade. Uh, Carl Philip Gabler loves paper doll Veronica. Uh, he is a fantastic chad of a man, and he encourages everyone to read Watership Down. Uh, Ardenon, hello. How the story is told is important, and the Paper Doll Veronica story is compelling. Um, Girl Genius has a snark issue. Yeah, it's gotten pretty snarky uh, recently, and it's, it's pretty bad. It was very good, like it was the right balance. Uh, I want to say up to the time skip uh, and even a bit past that but eh. um, the Iron Fish uh, Roland says the Iron Fish show does the romance out of nowhere thing hard it really does suck a merit for some decent romance ship of Ishtar uh, if the lead female has more than one guy chasing her over a long period and must decide between the two you're probably dealing with a more feminist based story uh, yeah, uh, though in Girl Genius it's absolutely hilarious uh, because she's aware and is playing it deliberately because she kind of wants both of them. Uh, but then again, it's not a Christian story. Yeah. Uh, That's pretty funny. They're both dark, brooding, and handsome. Uh, you know, with, with fiery tempers and explosive scientific reasoning. Uh, they have excellent screwdrivers, you see. Um, is that an any window? No. No, actually. Not in this story. Uh, ERB for the rap, eh, epic rap battles? Maybe? I don't know what ERB is, Arden on, sorry. Uh, that's a big reason I dislike modern storytelling, says Rawl. Uh, the idea of heroic male saving the beautiful female is purposefully excluded. Uh, uh, ERB is Edgar Rice Burroughs. Ah, there you go. Thank you. Merg Magler Maxis says, uh, tell me about it. It's infuriating. 
uh, on and on, yet it's a horrific level of failure. Raw replies, it's a big reason I wrote The Perils of Sasha Reed the way I did. I wanted the main female to be to, who adored her man uh, and a man who was loyal to his woman. Uh, Merg says, adding the novel to my buy list, keep up the good work. Thank you. Uh, Felis Concolor. Uh, I never could get into Utana. It falls into if you can't convince them, confuse them category. And I certainly don't want to be confused by someone I think is a woman. Um, Murr, can anyone recommend uh, some classic fairy tales I can get related to the discussion? I'd like a library of such material for my future children. Oh, yeah. Fortunately... As long as it doesn't say the feminist retelling of, uh, a lot of failure, fable fairy tales are actually well preserved, um, especially anything 1990 before. Uh, you do want to check some authors. There are some authors you have to look out for, but in general, if you buy anything used and over 30 years old, it's pretty guaranteed to be pretty good especially also in the late 90s, where I got a lot of mine. They're very good indeed. Uh, but I believe, uh, I'm going to toss this to you, Mary. You said something about uh, three eyes, two eyes, one eye? Uh, yes, I read that in the, I don't remember which color it was, but there's the Colored Fairy Books by Andrew Lang. Oh, excellent. I did, yeah. Sorry, keep going. Which he edited in, the, I think, at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. And they're just wonderful books. Abs you can get them new from Dover. Also, I do find them a lot in uh, used bookstores. So, you know, always support your local used bookstore. Um, and by that I mean buy out uh, the horrible people, uh, people's books and then burn them. Um, correlation is the beginning of causation discovery uh, here's my ex-girlfriend who drove me to drink and I forgot to thank her <laughs> uh, also junior classics from Castalia absolutely I've actually started to find them and I discovered a copy of a junior classic like volume 9 and it was like the 69th edition what 69 printings wow grim Ezekiel, oh yeah, that, that, uh, Ezekiel literally has a passage against that kind of justice, so there's precedent. Uh, also, punishment through the descendants sounds like a sinister method of control and enslavement. It is, actually. Um, the shopping cart test is a platonic object. Yep, so is the witch test. Uh, Rawl says, great conversation, and now I know about Mary MacArthur and Paper Doll Veronica. I've got to go now, but thanks. Thank you, thanks. Rawl. Mm. Chip Fursden calls for a source a source, a kingdom for a source astral uh, we a source, uh, it came to me in a dream that's how I do all my writing um, one time I had a dream that heaven rejoiced when the Anglo-Saxons became Christian because they gave up their vengeance which to them was as deep a sin as uh, alcoholism or drunkenness is to Russians. Uh, dreams, wonderful things. And that's how you tell it's fiction, virtuous feds. Uh, <laughs> I pick up the book and it glows in the dark. Uh, I don't even need a light to read it. Howard Lovecraft together created the most crazy of literary categories, weird tales. I love weird tales. And I wish it was a bit more, wish we could do more with science fiction and weird tales. That flavor. Um, but that's a whole discussion I'm going to probably have to have solo. Uh, just because it is very involved. Ironically, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, water, uh, compared to the Silmarillion, would qualify as nothing more than a footnote in the latter work, entitled Evil's Last Gasp. Tolkien is the guy who accidentally created multiple industries, just by engaging in his autistic hobby. Uh, yes, God bless the autists. Uh, indeed. Alright. 
thank you very much for joining us, Mary. I know those were quite rapid fire, but I do want to help our fans and provide some engagement. Did you know we had six concurrent viewers even now? Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. You're a wonderful guest. I Have believe it. we went up to nine, which is a great day. Woo! Uh, though, everyone, please come in next week where we will be doing the Protestant versus Catholic. Uh, not that it's a real argument, but, you know, discussing the various events around the middle part of the Reformation up to the Council of Trent, uh, which is the next major event. Uh, and Yeah, uh, I was going to actually say that to you. We should stop before Council of Trent, right? Because that's yes. a topic that is literally worth a stream on its own. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like, as, as a Protestant, like, a lot of things became irreversible after the Council of Trent. And I know that for Catholics, it's almost, uh, I don't know if I'd call it a victory, but it's certainly one of those things where things like the Catechism and other stuff flow from it. Uh, and it really codifies what the Church is. It's very telling that there's no actual major councils that matter until Vatican I. At least as I understand it. I'm sure there were small things. Yeah, no, that. you're correct. It goes Trent to Vatican I. Uh, yeah. Roughly. Roughly. Um, I might be missing, like, minor councils, but yeah. Yeah, there, you know, there's always something small going on, um, even in our times. Uh, but the, the kicker will be, you know, we will be talking about Luther, uh, what had happened. Uh, do re listen to the previous Reformation stream, just because I... You know, both of us establish the setup for it. You know, what were the people who just flocked to the Reformation thinking? What was on their minds? You know, why did they do the things they did? It wasn't out of a hatred of Catholicism. Those who, uh, it was for the, the salvation of their souls, at least in their minds. You know, for the Catholics, they definitely wanted to keep, you know, what made them Christian. You know, whatever I agree or disagree with. You know, they didn't go in there and saying, well, we'll put down these rebels. You know, they weren't dealing with Cathars, who were clearly heretical in every sense of the word. But they were dealing with their Christian brother, their Christian neighbor, fathers and sons. And, you know, there are verses about that that say, you know, I've come to divide, you know, father from son, mother from daughter, and so on. But, you know, we saw it in Europe. Please join us. Uh, I will be doing a... Uh, stream where I read out the um, 95 theses uh, sometime during the week. I keep needing to do it, and it keeps getting put off. Uh, though I will have yeah, to... Yeah, it's pretty funny, because I, I was wondering if I should suggest that you say it to a background of Gregorian chant, and then I thought, no, no, that's too ironic. I'll just have my uh, wonky air conditioner in the background. Uh, <laughs> but we're not an irony channel here. We are shock genuine thank you all for joining us come in next week uh the week after that uh i'll figure out something i think we will i don't know eh, i know on the 28th i'll be uh, 26th i might i'll be gone but you know we'll figure out something we'll keep you entertained uh and without all the lions and the christians though just the christians no lions have a good one and we're no longer live. <laughs>